Stanford University. Okay, uh, first of all, for our out-of-town visitors, welcome. Uh, tonight is the first night of a three-day symposium uh, at Stanford on the issue of marriage equality. Um, most of you know me in the room, but my name is Gary Segura. I'm a professor of political science. I'm director of the Institute of the, on the Politics of Inequality, Race, and Ethnicity at Stanford and the co-director of the Stanford Center on, on American Democracy. Uh, Inspires is one of two hosting organizations for this event, my colleague Jane Schachter, the distinguished Jane Schachter. Say hi, Jane. From the Stanford Law School is the other host, and we've organized this conference to examine two recent Supreme Court rulings, um, uh, Hollingsworth v. Perry and the United States versus Windsor. Those two cases challenging California's Proposition 8 and the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, respectively, have dramatically restructured the politics of marriage equality in the United States. Over the next two days, we'll hear from some outstanding scholarship and some of the nation's best minds in thinking about LGBT legal and political struggles. So tomorrow and Saturday, those panels will be in room 190 of the law school building, and we'll hear from these scholars as they consider the legal, social, and political circumstances that preceded the two cases, as well as their consequences. And tomorrow night in this room, our second plenary will feature plaintiffs and attorneys uh, from the cases at 7 p.m. in this room. Um, before we start, I want to thank the sponsors of the event. Uh, they include the Office of the Provost here at Stanford, the Stanford Law School, the School of Humanities and Sciences, the Center for American Democracy, the Office of the Vice Provost for Graduate Education, the Department of Political Science, INSPIRES, the Clayman Institute for Gender Research, the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and the Program in Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Tonight, we focus on politics, activism, and strategizing that continue to inform the marriage struggle. Specifically, we will look at journalists, traditional and new media, activists and insurgents, and large LDP, LGBT organizations that have worked not always together to advance the cause of LGBT equality. So with that in mind, it's my privilege to introduce our panelists, and I'll start um, from the far end of the table and work my way back here. Robin McGee is a Southern transplant who lives in Fresno, California, and is a communication professor at the College of Sequoias. She is the recipient of the 2001 Martin Luther King Jr. Award for her work on youth empowerment, and she responded to the 2008 Prop 8 loss after being thrown off the PTA at her son's elementary school by organizing a march called Meet in the Middle in Fresno, drawing attendance from the entire state. She was then recruited to co-direct a national march on Washington. The National Equality March turned out over 250,000 people in 2009. In 2010, she co-formed Get Equal in an effort to call for full equality for LGBT people. Her journey post Prop 8 led to pictures of her being arrested with Lieutenant Dan Choi at the White House fence and as a White House guest at the signing of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, arrested at the gate and then inside the building. She has, it's kind of a tradition, I think. Um, she has continued to pressure President Obama to be the fierce advocate he campaigned to be and has been arrested locally to challenge a conservative city council to stop discriminating against the LGBT community. Please welcome Robin McGee. <laughs> Sitting next to her is Michelangelo Signorile. He is editor at large for Huffington Post Gay Voices. He's an author, a journalist, and a commentator and the host of the Michelangelo Signorilia Show, which airs uh, weekdays on Sirius XM Progress. Signorilia has served as an editor-at-large and columnist for The Advocate and an editor-at-large and col columnist for Out Magazine. He is the author of several books, including Queer in America, a seminal book on the gay closet, and Life Outside, a finalist for the New York Public Library Book Award for Excellence in Journalism. Signorilia has covered LGBT politics and culture for over 20 years and is a regular guest on TV news programs. Please welcome Michelangelo Senior Relay. <laughs> Joe Sudbay. Joe Sudbay has, for the past seven years, been working with progressive organizations as the president of Sudbay Strategies. From November of 2004 through May of 2012, he served as deputy editor of America Blog, and beginning in June of 2009, America Blog Gay. 
In February of 2009, he became the first blogger credentialed to attend a presidential news conference. In October of 2000, that would turn out to be a big mistake. In October of 2010, Joe was one of five bloggers to conduct the first ever sit-down interview with President Obama. And during that interview, the president first acknowledged that his views on same-sex marriage were, quote, evolving, end quote. From 1994 to 2000, Joe worked at Handgun Control Incorporated, ultimately serving as its political director. Joe has a JD from the University of Maine School of Law and an MPA from Lehigh University and received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of New Hampshire. Please join me in welcoming Joe Sudbay. <laughs> Chad Hunter Griffin is the president of the Human Rights Campaign. Griffin has spent his career taking on entrenched well-financed interests like big tobacco, big oil, and the far right, and shaped national policy debates around equal rights, clean energy, universal health care, stem cell research, and early childhood education. He is a founding board member of the American Foundation for Equal Rights, which was the sole sponsor of the Proposition 8 lawsuit. He is personally responsible for recruiting the legal team of Ted Olson and David Boyes to successfully argue the case. A veteran of the Clinton White House communications team and a native of Arkansas, Griffin was highly motivated by, motivated by young people to embark on his new endeavors. Please welcome Chad Hunter Griffin. And joining the panel tonight as an interlocutor is Michael Mestitz. Michael attended undergraduate uh, school at Vassar College and is currently in his second year at Stanford Law School where he serves as one of the co-presidents of Outlaw, Stanford's LGBT student organization, which is a great name for a student organization. It is a triple entendre and I appreciate it. So thank you, Michael. For And so the way I thought we would proceed is I'm going to give each of our guests about 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about um, their role or their place in the um, uh, grassroots activism, journalism, and blogging um, uh, approach to the marriage equality issue. Um, and then Michael and I will, will pose a question to each of our, um, our uh, guests, and then we'll open it up to you for questions and answers. So we'll start first with Robin. say that I was an accidental activist. I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, as um, he stated. And uh, growing up there, I watched the organizations that uh, were branded to fight for my equality with so much affinity. I remember in 1993 watching the March on Washington and in Jackson, Mississippi, just praying that it was going to reach me behind enemy lines. Um, and one day, this feeling of being unequal was you know, eventually going to go away, not only in a feeling of being inferior, but also in having the rights of being fully equal as an American citizen. Um, and moved to California thinking that I was going to go where all the Mississippi people said where the fruits and nuts were. Um, and I was going to be living in this utopia where everybody was treated equal. And um, I was going to be able to run away from injustice. And I planted my feet in the soil of Fresno, California, which if anyone knows the Central Valley of California, it's much like um, Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, I quickly realized that you can't run from inequality and discrimination. You have to fight where your feet are planted. Um, and that's exactly what happened when Prop 8 was put on the ballot. Much like Chad, it was kind of like a, a feeling of being disenfranchised from the state-based organization and not feeling like um, things were handled in the way that they should have been. Specifically in Fresno, um, there wasn't a lot of focus on getting signage and um, you know, uh, the resources that we needed as citizens in, in an area that was blanketed by yellow yes on eight signs. Um, so I became an accidental activist driving to San Francisco and LA, picking up blue no on eight signs, bringing them to the valley. Um, and like rice rations, people were fighting for the signs. Um, and that led to being interviewed on the local television station, and then you know people finding out that I was a mother, and then all of a sudden, where my son was going to school, although I was the president of the PTA, um, I was quickly found out um, to be advocating when the priest at the Catholic elementary school that my son was attending uh, was not happy with that advocacy. So uh, even though we had two lesbian teachers on board and you know, they completely knew our family had two gay dads and two gay moms. Um, and all that led to realizing really quickly for me that if they could have voted to put us on the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, they probably would have done that too. 
Um, and the only thing that I could do now, because it was the Tuesday that we lost, this was Friday when they decided to throw me off the PTA, I was like, okay, well, they won. So the only thing that we can do now is fight back. And I, and I remember having a conversation with Chad, and he said, we don't have to fight the way that they're fighting. Um, we can fight in our own unique ways. And that's exactly um, what we did in, in lots of different ways. In the Central Valley, we decided to invite everyone across the state to come stand in the place that voted most against us, in one of the areas of the state that voted most against us. Um, and from that, I had the luxury of meeting Cleve Jones. And if you've ever had the ability to listen to Cleve speak, it was mesmerizing and is still the most inspiring speech I've ever heard in my life. Um, and that was at the moment of you know, Harvey Milk's uh, film and Dustin, Lam Dustin Lance Black's Milk. And that led to David Mixner's call of a march on Washington. And all the time I thought, you know, someone else is listening. And surely, um, you know, the president's going to finally come out for marriage equality because he said that was one of his, you know, platforms to fight for equality and full equality. And this is going to be the moment. Um, and to be quite honest, I was a mother dealing with depression. I couldn't believe what was going on with my son. You can imagine a six-year-old who's saying, you know, just take me back to my school where, um, and tell him I'll be a good boy. Um, and all you're thinking about is why is my six-year-old learning uh, the words of discrimination right now? I just wanted to be involved in volunteering. So we marched on Washington, and that led to um, someone saying, you know, hey, why don't you do something more? Why not organize some nonviolent civil disobedience? Let's look at the stories of the civil rights movement, which were images and, you know, stories that I had learned about growing up in Jackson, Mississippi, about, you know, the sit-ins and the fight for saying, we're not just going to ask for our white rights, we're going to demand them. Um, and that led to the founding of um, Get Equal with a person named Kip Williams, who had co-organized the March on Washington with us. Um, and from there, what honestly happened for me was I met a guy named Lieutenant Dan Choi, and it turned into the right to serve instead of the right to marry. So my issue became more on the back burner, and his issue, which I felt like if I'm going to ask for him to fight for my right to marry, then i got to fight for his right to serve as well. Um, and that led to many different fights, not only for the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, but also for the call of marriage equality. Um, and being able to um, ve very much feel victorious in March um, when we finally won at the Supreme Court, but not feeling those feelings that I long for in Jackson, Mississippi, of just wanting to be equal. Um, and not only in that internal feeling, because I can feel like an equal human being, um, especially living in the state of California, thankfully to the Prop 8 case. Uh, but I can't feel that way if I know my brothers and sisters that are in Mississippi um, will have a long day before they'll enjoy the equality that I'm able to enjoy here. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming out. And thank you so much for um, inviting me. Really honored to be here. And with um, everyone up here who's just done uh, amazing uh, work uh, on the full spectrum of LGBT rights and certainly marriage, uh, my involvement with marriage and the issue of marriage goes back 20 years um, to that first case in Hawaii that really um, kind of catapulted um, the movement and took us eventually to the uh, Supreme Court. And it really goes back a little bit further in terms of my journal journalism career because I um, had been very involved in ACT UP uh, in the uh, late 80s. Uh, I had come out of journalism school and. Uh, in the 80s was uh, in entertainment journalism and going to parties and writing you know, for People magazine and uh, writing gossip and this and that. And um, like a lot of uh, people my age at the time, we were trying to avoid the fact that AIDS was um, happening all around us and it was starting to reach down into the next generation. And uh, I you know, suddenly had people around me who were uh, sick and dying. And so I wound up at, at ACT UP. Uh, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And um, I was electrified and politicized. It really changed my journalism uh, and my focus of my uh, work uh, and, and really inspired me in terms of movement politics and in terms of grassroots and in terms of what we could get done. Uh, we had to, um, our, our lives were at stake. We had to challenge the government 
uh, at every stand and every and at every turn, and uh, we were dealing with a very uh, harsh and, and homophobic uh, government, the Reagan Bush years at the time, and a lot of people had said, you know, ACT UP was was radical and crazy, and and you know were uh, taking the movement back and were doing terrible things, and protesting was you know not the way to do it, and. Um, we just knew that we had no other choice. We didn't have any other way uh, to get the message out. And there was probably a certain, you know, naivete. We were all very young, too, many of us. Uh, you know, we could get it done. We had to get it done. And I say all that because that really, you know, changed my perspective, obviously, on activism. And my journalism then, you know, I, I co-founded Outweek magazine at the time and then went on to uh, work at The Advocate and Out and elsewhere. And it was in 1993 that I went to Hawaii uh, when the um, case that really, as I said, brought us to where we are uh, today uh, was uh, first um, launched uh, couples in Hawaii uh, suing for uh, marriage and uh, getting a win at the Supreme Court there uh, based on gender discrimination. And the uh, enormous uh, backlash that happened, not just from the right, but also within our own, own community, uh, was pretty amazing. And you know, a lot of people are also just wondering, why Hawaii? So I said, I want to go there and, and find out what's going on. And of course, it, it all you know, made sense. Uh, Hawaii has been at the forefront of uh, so many of the civil rights battles um, that we've seen, workers' rights and feminism and abortion rights and the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, and it's a place that uh, has an you know, incredible diversity. Uh, and, and where white people are not the majority, uh, where there's 20% you know, a, a, a of a whole bunch of uh, different uh, ethnic groups. Um, and so it, it really kind of um, you know, made sense that it was there. But what also made sense were the couples there living in that environment. And, and yes, there's the Mormon church, and not to sugarcoat, you know, Hawaii uh, doesn't, you know, that it doesn't have that uh, anti-gay, um, you know, crowd there, but these these people in Hawaii, the the um, gay and lesbian couples, you know, had lived in a in a place that was a bit different, and for them, uh, this was the next logical choice. They had families to take care of. They had people that that you know in their lives that they needed to now really kind of bring into their uh, lives, and and marriage was the way that they wanted to do it. And they were as far removed, I mean, literally and physically from the central you know, part of the gay movement in, in, on the mainland uh, and Washington as you could possibly get. And they didn't have the data and the polling and the this and the that. And this. they simply you know, realized what they needed to do next. And, and it kind of reminded me of ACT UP again because it was that grassroots saying, you know, we need to do it. And yeah, I know you all think we shouldn't do it. And yes, the data and the polling and this and that, and there'll be a backlash and whatever, but we, we need to do this. And of course, there was, as I said, a backlash, uh, both uh, in the movement and obviously among um, the uh, people who work against um, all of us who are LGBT. And um, almost immediately, a lot of the groups in Washington, and including the human rights campaign of the time, certainly not the human rights campaign uh, now that Chad uh, is there, but were trying to stop that uh, lawsuit. They were trying to stop the activity there. They were trying to make the case to people that they shouldn't be doing this. They were certainly trying to stop people in other states from doing it, uh, worried about that backlash and worried about what was happening in Congress, of course, um, this put into motion uh, the movement for the Defense of Marriage Act, and well, we all know <laughs> where it went from there. And um, there was enormous amount of effort um, that was expended on trying to stop the activists from moving, rather than trying to stop, trying to change, spend more of your time trying to change the attitudes out there. Um, and 
I think it was in a way, a, a, you know, an example of how sometimes leadership doesn't understand that you have to follow the movement rather than, um, you know, trying to dictate. People were worried that there would be uh, that uh, backlash. Of course, we saw states all across the country pass uh, marriage amendments, and we saw the Defense of Marriage Act. Um, and so, yeah, there was that backlash. But I would argue that we couldn't have moved forward without that. <laughs> you need to sort of have a reaction. Uh, otherwise, you don't move anywhere. And we probably could have mitigated it if we had probably you know, spent more time um, and, and more energy uh, challenging the people who were our friends um, and you know, not uh, more concerned with access or more fearful of what was going to happen and this and that. And I'm you know, uh, talking about Bill Clinton signing the Defense of Marriage Act as well. Uh, there were, I, I think, a lot of lessons there uh, that, and when we then look now to what happened with President Obama, uh, we see that, you know, challenging the president is the way to do it uh, and is the way to, you know, bring that message uh, forward. And I feel like at the time, so much was done to try to stop the movement from moving forward and really, that case in Hawaii is what ultimately would bring us, I mean, obviously it brought us Proposition 8, but then it brought us to the Supreme Court eventually. It brought us the Defense of Marriage Act. It brought us uh, to the Supreme Court uh, as well. So it, 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 I think, shows us, and then when we see uh, what went on just in the last uh, few years with President Obama and challenging him again through activism, again through uh, the work that Robin's done, the work that uh, Joe has done as well, uh, challenging the president at every turn, disrupting his um, you know, speeches and uh, protesting. Uh, and a lot of people said the same thing. Don't do that. <laughs> it's not going to uh, get us anywhere. I, I think it again shows that we need to do that. And, and, and then I take it to Chad as well because, uh, again, um, Everybody said, don't take Proposition 8 to court. Don't do it. It's not going to work. It's going to be, uh, you know, it's go this is going to set us back. I think what we've learned is that you have to take that risk. And if you don't take the risk, and yes, look at what happened. We got the Defense of Marriage Act because of, you know, maybe what started in Hawaii. But if you don't take that risk, you don't go anywhere. You have to take the risk and then be willing to deal with the consequences. And then make sure you're all working together to mitigate the consequences if they're bad, rather than trying to stop activists and stop the grassroots. And I hope that's something uh, we've learned a lot better uh, now moving forward. Um, thanks, Gary, for inviting me out. And uh, I'm glad to be on this panel with these guys. Um, I started blogging at America Blog in November of 2004 because of the 2004 election. And thinking back, when, you woke, when I woke up the day after the election in 2004, I was afraid. I was afraid as a gay man because of what just happened. We had a president who ran on a campaign vilifying us, and 11 states passed constitutional amendments. It was a scary place. So I started writing on America Blog as an outlet to just have a voice and to fight back. And the blogs in 2004, 2005, 2006 were really getting our, getting our, our sea legs and figuring out what we could do, what we could accomplish. And one thing that became very clear was that um, I live in Washington, right? And Washington's a funny town. You're all watching it now. It's embarrassing to see what's going on there. But it, it's also, it, it, you know, people talk about an inside the beltway mentality. There really is an inside the beltway mentality. And I used to work in gun control. I do work with Gary and immigration, and I work on gay issues. All three of those issues are pariah issues, or had been pariah issues for a long time. Where you get a lot of good lip service from people during campaigns about how they need your help, and from the gays, they need your money. But when they win, they really can't talk to you because it's bad. Uh, I coined the term political homophobia. I, it's not that people are homophobic in the traditional sense, but they're afraid. They were politicians in D.C. were very afraid of the gay issue. The 2004 elections made them afraid. 
Doma made them afraid. Any number of things made them afraid. Polling made them afraid. The right wing made them afraid. Our allies were very much afraid. And we started to see this early in 2007. You know, we were gearing up for a presidential election. And you know, if you're any kind of progressive, you knew we needed change. And if you were gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, you knew we could not have four more years of, of, of anti-gay Republicans. So in the beginning of 2007, the Democratic National Committee invited John Aravosis and me to come and interview the presidential candidates. And we thought, we better take this seriously. So we prepared questions. We really thought about it. And we knew none of the candidates were supporting marriage. But we knew they supported civil unions. But none of them had really thought through what that meant. Like, sure, you get a civil union, but there's still DOMA. So we decided to ask a question if people of the candidates um, would they support a repealing DOMA or at least amend DOMA to allow for civil unions? We thought it was a very fair question. I asked Chris Dodd. He hadn't thought about it, but he thought it was a great idea. John asked Wes Clark. And then we were supposed to interview Hillary Clinton. But um, I inadvertently told one of her staffers what we were going to ask her. And that interview was shut down. And I was screamed at for about 15 minutes, because how could I ever ask her a question like that? And coming away from it, was one, it, was, it was a real eye-opener thinking, you know what? This is going to be tougher than we thought. We still are in a bad place politically if we can't ask candidates about DOMA. So we get through the, you know, the next few months. I actually was at Netroots Nation and got into a, some, I got invited to a room with Barack Obama. And I asked him about marriage. And my question to him was, you know, it was all off the record, OK? P.S. This meeting was off the record. And, and I said, you know, um, you know, when I look at the candidate, when, I, when we look at demographics, it's pretty clear that the younger you go on the spectrum, the um, stronger support is for marriage. And then when I look at the presidential candidates and the age of the presidential candidates, you're younger than I am. So I want to know where you are, where you can be. He gave me this really long answer. You know, talked to, he, he actually invoked Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail and talked about you know, the process. We had to get hate crimes done, then end, and then don't ask, don't tell. Then we could think about DOMA. But at one point, he said, you know, I do think that every marriage should be a civil union first. There should be a part of it that takes the religion out. And I thought, oh, that I like. But of course, as soon as he walked out of the room, I was sworn by his staff to remind me that, in fact, that was off the record and I could never tell anyone. Uh, I didn't tell anyone for a while, but here I am. Um, so anyways, then what happened was um, you know, Obama got the nomination. We also had Prop 8, right? And I think if you're in California, Prop 8 impacted you personally. But I, I, I think Prop 8 impacted gay and lesbian and bisexual transgender Americans across the country. I think it was a, 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 such a pivotal thing to change how we viewed our role in American politics. We had rights taken away from us. That should not happen in America in 2008. I think it fundamentally changed the way people felt about politics. I don't think that that permeated inside the Beltway. And I don't think it permeated the Obama campaign, because a couple weeks later, they invited Rick Warren to be the inaugural speaker, right? That was like rubbing salt into a very raw wound. Um, and, it, and it was a signal. I think it did two things. It said to the LGBT community, this is not going to be a cakewalk. If we want things, we're going to have to work for them. And it also w was pretty clear that the Obama campaign was kind of oblivious to where we were as a community. So um, in early June of 2009, I was actually at a meeting at the Human Rights Campaign. Um, I had um, a bunch of people I had done work with there, and I was very friendly with them. We were having, they wanted to have a strategy session to figure out how we could get hate crimes done. Couldn't get hate crimes done, right, in June of 2009. And before I left the meeting, I said, you know, everyone, um, we're expecting a, a response from in the Gill case by the end of the month. And if the Obama administration defends DOMA, I think there's going to be huge problems. It's going to be a big backlash. And I was told, because and this was pre-Chad, um, but they had a lot of very important um, lobbyists in the room. And I was told quite clearly, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Obama had to defend DOMA. And I was stupid to think otherwise. And I said, well, you may think that. But I can tell you the way where the community is, if Obama defends DOMA, there's going to be backlash. And your little fundraiser at the end of the month, your DNC fundraiser, is going to be trouble. Well, 
It wasn't the Gill case. It was another case that two days later we found out about on America Blog, and John and I just blew the story up. We're like, Obama's defending DOMA. Not only that, that they used basically the same brief that the Bush administration had used. It was such an insult. And I have to tell you, like in June of 2009, it was a scary place to be challenging the Obama administration because just about every other organization and every other active, every other progressive in DC was still in that love affair and swooning over the administration, trying to get invitations to meetings, gloating about getting invited to parties, and here we were starting a fight. And I, I said to my partner, I said, you know what? I'll, I'll, I, I do consulting work. I said, I'll probably lose all my clients. I don't care. I will bag groceries. I will have my dignity. I'm not putting up with this bullshit anymore. <laughs> and um, a, couple, a couple months later, I did find out that actually the day after that, the president asked one of his top aides for the brief. He said, I have to figure what the hell this is all about. So we got his attention. And we made a story. And you know, um, we continued to push and fight. We engaged in the Don't Ask, Don't Tell fight and teamed up with Robin and her, her crew. And I mean, I don't know how many times I was on Mike's radio show talking about this. And I was a total pain in the ass to them. But somehow, I still got invited to sit across from the president in October of 2010. And I was as surprised as anyone to get that phone call inviting <laughs> me, I'll tell you that. And, uh, but I really thought, and I was, I, I, I was very nervous about it, too, because I had been very upset with a lot of kind of uh, progressive advocacy community in DC who got access and used it just to have access and not for progress. So I felt a real obligation to go in and try and represent my community and speak to the president about where we were. And I did tell him that there was a lot of disappointment and disillusionment in the community. And he did tell me that he didn't think that disillusionment was justified, which I kind of thought, you can think that, but I know it. And it's unfortunate that you haven't figured it out. And we had a conversation about don't ask, don't tell. And we had a conversation about marriage. And I had been with Robin the weekend before. So she was sitting on my shoulder when I told the president that if our relationships aren't treated like everybody else's, then we're not equal. And that's when he first said, attitudes evolve, including mine, which and I thought that that was important. And it was, that was a rehearsed line. He, he had intended to say that. Um, but he also said later, as we had this back and forth, that it was pretty clear where the trend lines were going. And I thought that was really as important, that the president acknowledge that our equality was heading in the right direction. Um, so you know, he did give us an opening. So we started an Evolve Already campaign and kind of kept it up um, for the next few weeks and months and <laughs> years. And I, I kept making the political argument you know, because DC doesn't, DC has a mindset. The conventional wisdom is if you support marriage equality, you will lose. And, and we were fighting against that. Now, of course, in February of 2011, the White House stopped defending DOMA. And, guess, and, and they just stopped defending DOMA, right? It was a big, huge move. Um, Robbie Kaplan told me, she was Edie Windsor's lawyer. She told me that that was, she thought, one of the most significant events in the course of their lawsuit. And, 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 and it, it you know, it, it was so interesting because so many of the people who had told us that he had to defend Omar were now completely on board. Of course he doesn't have to defend Omar anymore. That's how Washington works, right? You know? <laughs> you, were, you were an idiot a year and a half ago, Joe, but yeah, now you're, yeah. But uh, I did think it was very important to make the case. You know, when the president was running for re-election, his campaign manager repeatedly said they needed to get huge Latino, Latino turnout, huge African-American turnout, and huge a turnout from young people, which of course young people by huge numbers support marriage equality. And I kept making the case that, you know, you need this enthusiasm from your base and, and you know, what is the president going to do if he gets into a debate with Mitt Romney and have Mitt Romney say, I have the same position as the president? What does that do? What kind of, who's going to get up early the next day to, you know, go lit, lit, lit drop or, or write another check? Um, and. I'm from Maine and had been in Maine in 2009, and the same thing hap that happened out here in 2008. You know, the other side, Frank Schubert used the line, and he and he used it effectively. You know, if you vote no, you're taking. The, if you vote against marriage, you're on the same side as Barack Obama. He doesn't support marriage, anyways. I thought that was important too. Anyways, I will. Um, I was probably as surprised as anyone when the president did come out for marriage, especially because it happened the day after we had a 
horrible defeat in North Carolina, which Chad knows. We, we lost an, a referendum in North Carolina on May 8th. And I actually that night thought, oh my God, the Obama people are going to look at North Carolina and think, you, you expect us to support marriage after what happened there? And then on May 9th, he did. And one of the great things about May 9th to me, May 9th, 2012, when the president endorsed marriage, I got very emotional when I watched, I watched the interview and I cried, I'll admit it, but it was the explosion of enthusiasm that was pervasive across the progressive community. Yes, it meant a lot to, the, to, our, to our community, but I just loved watching how so many people, you know, in, in, across the spectrum, embraced that and realized that this was a president that they could believe in again. Um, so what I think we did over the past, over the arc of the first term in the presidency is we changed the convention of wisdom and we changed the political dynamic in that now the wedge is on our side. Now, if you're not for marriage, you're, you're a bigot, you're on the wrong side of history, you're part of a dwindling, um, um, a part of a dwindling uh, community of, of people who are so out of touch. And, you know, the work started in Hawaii. People like Robin and Chad pushed it along. But the most important thing was that we challenged our leaders to catch up and, and, and to be where they needed to be. Thank you. And thanks, Gary, for, for organizing this. It's a real privilege to be on stage with the caliber uh, of folks that I'm on stage with. We, without question, wouldn't be where we are uh, in this movement today without the contributions um, of each of you. Um, you know, I had never really considered myself uh, an activist. In fact, um, I only recently, about a year and a half ago, became a professional gay. Um, I, um, I own my own business that I built over the last 15 years and had a political strategy, um, advertising, and philanthropic consulting business. Um, living in Los Angeles, but doing campaigns all over the country. And you may remember that the state of California was the first state legislature to pass marriage equality. And it went to the desk of Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, and several friends of mine uh, in the movement called me and wanted me to help get some of my clients to fund uh, newspaper ads, urging the governor to sign it, even though, even though they knew uh, we all knew that he was going, uh, going to veto it. And I was like, a newspaper ad? You know, I've fought the tobacco companies, I've fought the oil companies, I've fought the right wing. We need to play to win, and we need to make this governor feel pain. There needs to be a consequence to vetoing marriage equality in the state of California. Um, and so some friends of mine and I at our company came up with this ad concept. It was an ad called Hero. It scared everyone to death when they saw the script because it started out by saying, Governor Schwarzenegger, you have a choice. At this time, by the way, he was very popular. Um, Governor Schwarzenegger, you have a choice. You can have the legacy of, and you see this, you see images of RFK and JFK and Cesar Chavez and Martin Luther King, or you can follow the likes and then you see George Wallace's, um, Governor Wallace's image come on the screen. It ends with, Governor, the choice is yours. Um, and at first, everyone was scared to death. We can't put that on television. We can't put it on television. But I really urged folks to do it. And there were a number of progressive donors in the state that were excited to fund it, even though they were friends of the governor. Um, and we did it. Um, and it caught the governor's attention. Let me tell you, every friend of ours in the administration was immediately calling. They wanted meetings. People were pissed off. But that's our job when our friends, it's OK to push our friends. Um, that's who we're supposed to push, quite frankly. We're supposed to fight our enemies and push our friends. Um, and that was really my first entree um, into the political activism world. Um, the next, my next step into it was several years later, uh, and it involved, in fact, uh, featured uh, Michelangelo Signorelli. Um, a brilliant filmmaker in Los Angeles came to me um, with the idea of a film, um, an HBO film, that would be focused on hypocrisy. Um, that was the subject of the film, a documentary on hypocrisy. Its subjects were closeted elected officials who are anti-gay. Not just any closeted elected official, but an elected official who repeatedly votes against their self-interest. Repeatedly votes against hate crimes, votes for DOMA, on and on and on. Um, and um, Michael uh, was a star from beginning to end uh, of that film. And it got, again, a lot of attention and, and again, made folks somewhat uncomfortable. Journalists in, in Washington had really never um, asked that question, pushed the envelope 
uh, on that front. And, and I give all credit to those who had done the work for so long, um, in large part led by, by Michael and others, uh, but to the filmmaker Kirby Dick who, who made that film. And, and it really was a brilliant film that got an incredible amount of attention uh, and woke a few folks up. In fact, if you go back and watch that film today, you, you will see that several of them have evolved. If not in their own identity, in at least their support um, for LGBT rights, and in one evolved from a Republican to a Democrat, in fact. Lots of evolving going on in this country. And, and now fast forward um, to the end of, of Proposition 8. As that campa campaign went along, my role was um, I put money into the campaign, my own personal money, and I got all of my clients, all of whom were straight allies, uh, to fund that campaign. And as we were about four weeks out from the election, a little uh, greater than four weeks out, our numbers were just plummeting, and the other side's arguments were working, and their numbers were going up, and we were seeing it do just this. Um, and my firm came in, and we, we redid the advertising campaign for those last, those last four weeks. Um, and so we saw the numbers. The entire team uh, was changed towards the end, and we saw the numbers start to shift. All of a sudden, we saw the bleed stop, and then we saw our numbers climb. Election day comes, um, and sadly, uh, we fell short, as everyone knows. And that election night was one I will never forget the rest of my life. And I suspect that's the case um, for any of you, particularly if you're from California. Um, I was in a hotel room in downtown San Francisco. Downstairs was the Obama campaign ballroom, and across the hall was the Prop 8 ballroom. And I was upstairs with a couple of friends um, and with the mayor. There were six of us in the room. We were watching the election returns um, on the television for Obama. And then all of a sudden, they announce he's the winner. He's getting ready to walk out on that stage. We'll all remember the, the throngs of people that he walked out and the cheers. But in front of us on the coffee table was our computer screen where we were watching all the returns come in from California's 58 counties. And just as Obama was going on stage, it became abundantly clear that Proposition 8 was going to pass in California. We already knew that in my home state of Arkansas, an adoption ban uh, was passing, and in Florida, um, a constitutional amendment. I was going to a pass. And so I am a competitive person, as one in politics often is, and I really don't like to lose. Um, and so that was front of mind. But in addition to that, it was the message that was sent that night to young LGBT people all across this country, in small towns and big, that they are less than, that they're second class citizens. And oh, by the way, a vote of the people is telling them so. And so front of mind was the consequences, the immediate consequences. Forget the law and the repeal and marriages can't happen anymore, but the immediate consequences that were sent to that young person uh, on that election night or to that young person's parents on that election night. Um, I don't ever remember being more depressed in my life. I didn't sleep all night long. I woke up the next day and I flew to California uh, where I was living at the time. I went to work the next day, um, and I was driving home, and I was driving through West Hollywood. And for those of you who know the area, um, I got to about Robertson, uh, sorry, I got to San Vicente and uh, Santa Monica Boulevard, right in the middle uh, of West Hollywood. And I saw people gathering. I saw there were some police, there were a couple of hundred people. And so um, I parked my car. I had no idea what was going on. I parked my car, and hundreds turned into thousands, turned into several thousand. Um, and there were a few organizations in Southern California that had organized uh, an event. They had cl we closed down the street, and the gay men's chorus sang, as they do. And then they passed out candles, and there was a candlelight vigil. Folks were going to sing. But I started seeing thousands of people. It grew to, you know, reports were over 10,000 people. There were people I'd never seen before. I was standing by myself in the middle of that street, and I saw folks young and old, black, white, Latino, high school, college, people who had never been in the streets before. And I had this moment of, my God, Prop 8's passage truly woke up the world. I have no idea where this is going from here, but folks are taking to the streets. And that didn't happen just in California that night. It happened, or sorry, in Los Angeles. It happened all over the state and ultimately uh, all over uh, the country. And you saw people, they didn't want to hold those candles. They were throwing down the candles. They wanted to march. They wanted to take action because of the injustice that had happened uh, just that night uh, before. 
And so that night ended by my going home and just my head was churning. What's next for this movement? A vote of the people in the state of California just took away marriage equality. What the heck do we do now? Um, and one day I was um, at lunch, this was about four days later, and someone uh, walked by, I was having lunch with some friends, and someone walked by our table and they asked what we were talking about, and we said we were talking about how depressing, despite Obama's election, how depressing um, that election night was. Um, and later this person says, you know, if there's ever another federal court challenge, or if there's ever a court challenge, someone should talk to my former brother-in-law, Ted Olson. And I just sort of snickered inside and respectfully you know, nodded. I went home and I got a call from one of those friends at the table who said, would you ever talk to Ted Olson? I said, are you kidding me? I, he's a man I'd love to, I had loved to hate Ted Olson for almost a dozen years. Um, first of all, I don't believe he would hold a position uh, in support of marriage equality. But if he does, it's a game changer for our entire movement. If Ted Olson, the most prominent conservative attorney in America, who represented Bush and Bush v. Gore, the co-founder of the Federalist Society, George Bush's solicitor general, if he supports our position on marriage equality, think back at that time. The only Republican we had was Dick Cheney. That's it. It's hard to go back that far. We only had Dick Cheney. Um, and so I agreed to a series of calls. And um, long story short, um, I discovered that Ted Olson uh, not only agreed with um, the position uh, professionally, but personally. Um, had real and true and heartfelt convictions uh, about this issue. Um, and that led to uh, the four-year rise. We decided to file uh, a federal court case, which, again, today, there are over 30 federal court cases. Go back five years ago, there were zero. Um, decisions had been made to not take a federal challenge. There were state court challenges. Um, and so. This group, uh, a small group of us, about eight or 10 of us, vetted the idea, spent about five months um, thinking it through, looking at the pros and cons of, of filing a decision, knowing that many, if quite frankly not most, of my colleagues in the movement, including uh, many of the respected organizations, would disagree with me and, and uh, vehemently disagree with me uh, in that decision. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we made the decision. We made the decision to go forward and to claim our rights in federal court to claim our rights in federal court for the first time ever um, as it relates to marriage equality. Um, and we did, and we won. And thank God we had a trial that put discrimination on trial, uh, and we won. Discrimination has a hard time standing up uh, when you have expert witnesses uh, under oath, including some uh, in, this, in this room on our side um, and, and those on the other side. But now to just take it to sort of where we are today, um, you know, I was in the courtroom for those oral arguments on Windsor uh, and Perry Day. Today, as I said, there, there are children of Perry everywhere. We have, I, I think it's 35 some odd cases now um, across, uh, across the country in a number of states, including conservative southern states. Um, but what we have to keep our eye on are those 37 states that didn't feel the reach of justice by the Perry decision or by the Windsor decision. Um, and we came out of that courtroom that day, and I allowed about 12 hours of celebration, which was almost too much for me. We celebrated outside the Supreme Court that day, and then in California. And then the very next day, I never went to bed that night, and then the next day I started at 6 a.m. Um, going to Salt Lake City at Utah, um, the state and the church that quite frankly gave us uh, Proposition 8, um, to send the signal that this fight's not over uh, until we've brought full equality to the state of Utah as well. Um, and then I started a state, um, a tour across the South in Arcan my home state of Arkansas to Virginia to North Carolina, and ultimately uh, in Mississippi. Um, and it's those 37 states that are truly the frontier of the movement that we're in today. If you look at a map of this country, there are two stripes with dots in the middle, the coasts. We've largely achieved legal equality, largely. Still a lot of dots to fill in on the coast, but largely we've achieved legal equality. Um, what we've got to do is fill in that map um, all across this country. Um, and they don't have, in a state like Mississippi or Arkansas, there's zero protections. It is illegal for a same-sex couple uh, to adopt children. Uh, it is perfectly legal to be fired because you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Um, we have a long ways to go in those places, and I'll just end on this note. That day in Mississippi, um, 
we released a bipartisan poll. We hired Mitt Romney's pollster and, um, and Obama's pollster to release a bipartisan poll to show where the country is and where the folks in Mississippi are, including Republicans, um, on the issues of equality and non-discrimination um, and anti-bullying laws. Um, and for the first time, we convened a table. We convened about 20 folks. There's no one that works full time uh, on the issue of equality, but there are organizations that have an interest um, in equality. And so we had about 20, 25 people around that table where we all talked about what we do and how we can better coordinate and how we can better work together. And it was an incredible 90 minutes. Um, we were in a restaurant where we were served fried chicken sandwiches, and for the vegetarians in the room, we were served fried green tomato sandwiches. Um, that's true, by the way. Um, and sweet tea. All of a sudden, the meeting's over. We're about to adjourn. And there was one waiter in this room the entire time. And at the, the conclusion of the meeting, we were just about to wrap up. He comes from behind the counter where he'd been serving and walks up to the table and says, excuse me, this might be inappropriate, but I want to introduce myself. My name is Cody. I'm 25 years old. I came out of the closet only a couple of years ago. And a few months ago, I was diagnosed as HIV positive. There's not a single day since then that I haven't wept or felt hopeless. And for the first time in my life, I've happened into a room that is having a conversation about me and my life where I live. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of Cody's all over this country. We have achieved legal equality on our coasts. Now we have to do it in the South and in the Midwest. All right. So I want to thank the presenters for their comments. Um, I, um, Michael and I are going to um, off offer some questions and then open it up to all of you. I have just one question for each panelist, and then I'll turn it over to Michael. And, um, so I'm not going to go specifically in the order in which I, I saw you, because I'm going to kind of build up to, to something here. Um, so I'm going to start with Michelangelo Signorile. And I'm going to ask a question that's kind of contrary to the entire point of the next three days, uh, which goes something like this. A few prominent gay intellectuals have expressed disinterest or even disgust with marriage equality or with an, an agenda that is marriage equality and military service as the most visible goals of the LGBT movement, the Andrew Sullivan agenda, if you will. <laughs> Your career started very controversially with Outweek and the practice of outing, not to offend, but to treat honestly as a journalist the motives of those who were working against LGBT equality. And you've spoken extensively about that over the last 20 years, and we know what your view is on that. But so that leads me to the following question. From your perspective, from the start of your career to today, and I should tell the audience that I found out just a few hours ago that Mike is married. Um, <laughs> is marriage a conservative goal or a radical goal for the LGBT movement? Is it the culmination of LGBT equality efforts or their betrayal? Wow. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I just wrote a piece on Huffington Post about, um, I just got married uh, literally, um, what, a month ago, two months of uh, July. And um, you can't forget ago, that date, Michael. Ago. We've been together, <laughs> well, we've been together 18 years. Um, and for us, it was not. Um, you know, what it may be for a lot of people, and which I think is wonderful, particularly younger people who now have the, you know, opportunity to do this in the way that maybe uh, their straight, you know, colleagues or straight uh, friends and, and family do as well, kind of, you know, that first love or whatever. For us, we've been together 18 years. DOMA was gone. We live in New York. We want the benefits. Um, but I wrote this piece about the word husband and you know, mm. whether or not uh, we like that because um, we, we've gotten so used to partner, which I remember when everybody partner was just so weird too. And I, I wrote about how 
you know, this conundrum where using the word husband, you know, is not just obviously, you know, something that kind of mimics, you know, straight people and kind of possession of, you know, husband and wife and, but when, and we, were in, we lived in New Zealand for um, a couple of years um, and in New Zealand, straight people had purged the words husband and wife uh, as well. Feminists were very successful at getting rid of these terms. And I remember whenever I would be in a cab and I would talk about my partner works at the university because he's a professor, and I said, oh, my partner works at the university, I would never have to out myself to the cab driver because he could think that I was you know, heterosexual. So then I thought about how, gee, is, is, so is that what it really is? Is actually using the word husband and acknowledging that I'm married actually um, you know, very radical because there I am out having to out myself to a cab driver versus obviously the idea of mimicking heterosexuals. I think you could probably look at it both ways. What I was talking about earlier, I think, relates to this in terms of going where um, where the movement go, where the movement is going, where people want to go, where where we see people experiencing discrimination. And and I again. I have a problem with people dictating and saying, oh, this isn't what uh, LGBT rights is. Uh, this isn't what LGBT equality is. This isn't what liberation is. Uh, it is for you what it is for you. But when people are experiencing discrimination, when people are um, thrown out of their jobs, when people are thrown out of their houses, when people's relationships are not uh, you know, respected and are discriminated against, uh, to me, that is very real, and that is something that we have to take on. And then I think we can have this debate and discussion um, as we go as well. And, I, and I've also been opposed to that, too. There's been, there's been not only a desire to um, decide what's right for everybody, but then even after we decide that or supposedly decide, okay, we're focused on marriage, we're not supposed to even talk about how we don't may not uh, all agree on it. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times people have said, oh, don't bring that up or don't bring this up. Uh, I, in that original article that I wrote in, in Out Magazine about Hawaii, uh, and this gets to Andrew Sullivan, I, um, I wrote sort of his position. I, I wrote about this as kind of movement politics, like where do we go and what do we do? And gay conservatives are saying this and uh, gay uh, progressives and, and people on the left are saying this. And, and Andrew Sullivan, I think what he had said at the time, he wrote about marriage in the context of AIDS and wrote about marriage as civilizing, it could civilize gay men, uh, which I really had a, a huge problem with. And I thought, no, it really is the opposite way around. Maybe um, gay and lesbian people could civilize marriage. You know, maybe that's actually what we're doing. Uh, maybe that's what women actually did through the feminist movement as well, making it fairer and more equal. So, I, you know, I, I wrote something there, like looking at, at, at the position of Paula Edelbrick, the late, late Paula Edelbrick, uh, who was um, not in favor of uh, marriage. And I looked at Andrews and I said, maybe a middle ground is pretty much what I just said. You know, we will transform this institution and blah, blah. That line has been used by NAM, the National Organization for Marriage, and every other anti-gay group for 20 years. <laughs> for 20 years, they have used my saying that we're going to transform it. It was even a footnote. I think it was a footnote in the Proposition 8, or they referred to it in, in, in the arguments. The Prop 8 proponents referred to it in their arguments. Uh, and people have said to me, and I've gotten emails from people over the years, like, why did you say that? Why did you write that? Why did you? I mean, we can fight for our rights. We can fight for everybody's rights. We can disagree about what we're about. We can have a discussion about it. And we need to be able to have the discussion and actually win uh, our rights while still having that discussion. Otherwise, to me, then we haven't won. So that's my thing. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question I'm going to direct to uh, Robin. Um, 
Robin, tell us just a little bit more about Get Equal, and specifically, did Get Equal arise in opposition to the Obama administration's inaction, or did it arise in opposition to the Human Rights Campaign and the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force's inaction? Um, my sense is that Get Equal was founded out of frustration, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, frustration with whom. Uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that it was an either or. I do believe that, you know, the, what Chad talked about that night um, in reference to feeling, you know, kind of bipolar, you're yelling in one room with excitement and then the other room you're feeling like, what the hell just happened? Um, and also feeling um, disenfranchised with the remarks because even in those celebratory accepted speech remarks that Barack Obama made that night, he mentioned gay. Um, in the speech, and I felt uh, disenfranchised from his rhetoric uh, because I felt that you know he was one of the voices that was on the <coughs> robocalls that the other side was using against us, um, and I felt like he could have made a, a stronger uh, advocacy on our part, but also could have really come out as a civil rights pioneer for this issue. Um, and so, yes, I would say the Obama administration was one part of frustration, but I also felt like um, a movement to elect a president, especially an African-American president for the first time, um, it was a call for a person to be the fierce advocate that he had promised to be. And really, that was the rhetoric that we really tried to go forth with with the, the March on Washington. Um, and I think that that, you know, what was surprising to me is that um, I remember standing with Cleve Jones outside the hotel, and he was telling us that he had gotten word that uh, the administration was in conversations with HRC at the time about um, where should the president go? Should he come to the national dinner, which th was the night before the National Quality March, or should he uh, meet with organizers of the march and understand why all these people, these grassroots activists, are actually marching on Washington? Um, and one of the uh, insiders of the administration said, um, and they felt like the safest bet was to go to the HRC dinner because um, it's going to show that, yes, these angry people are marching on Sunday, but the reality is everybody's going to look happy and satisfied on Saturday night, um, and nobody's really going to pay attention to the march the next day. And honestly, that's exactly how I felt. There was a, a very much a, a disenfranchised feeling um, from the organizations, I mean, I have, you know, the blue and yellow sticker on my car. Um, I had it in Mississippi. Um, I felt very connected to the state-based organization EQUO or EQCA. Um, and I felt that I kept waiting for the moment that HRC or NGLTF was going to say, there's a, people that are calling for something, and we need to listen to what they're calling for, and how do we organize this together? Um, instead, it was, you know, we planned that march um, with $189,000. That was the budget for the march. We had $150,000, but we raised it to $189,000 just by sheer fundraising efforts. Um, but it was more feeling that dis disenfranchised feeling of, wait a minute, this plateau or this, um, this, uh, this feeling of there's this savior or this organization out there that represents me, I didn't feel it at that moment. Um, and I will say honestly, I, and I say this in, with deep sincerity, that I feel that more with Chad at the helm. Um, and it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't a, a hatred against the previous president. It was more feeling like there was not a listening to the grassroots. And I, and I will also say, and not to put Chad on the spot at all, I think we're still at that point. I think that there needs to be that conversation to say, um, hey, what is on the ground that we could be, do I do believe we should be marching on Washington right now. We should be organizing another march and getting, um, if we can't get everything, getting something. And I think that action begets action. So it was a call not only for the president, but it was a call for organizations to listen to people who were saying enough is enough and please work with us to get everything. And that means my next question is to Chad. Chad, you had the largest mainstream LGBT group in the United States. When at the helm of AFER, you filed the suit against Prop 8, and lots of mainstream folks, as you mentioned, thought you were crazy and said so publicly. 
The human rights campaign was, under your predecessor, stereotyped by its critics as corporate and bureaucratic, while AFER was lean and nimble and down to business. Now you run HRC, and it puts you in a different position. So I want to ask sort of a two-part question. First, do you feel like you have moved HRC in the direction of where you were at AFER, or has HRC moved you in the direction of Joe Salamanese? And secondly, when is there an executive order on employment on discrimination? Yeah, well, that, that's an important question, um, and it should have already happened, uh, starting in, in sort of reverse order. You know, President Obama, uh, part of his campaign platform um, was that he would issue an executive order covering federal contractors. I think most of you know what that means, but uh, the best way to talk about that is to use an example. Exxon Mobil, um, which is truly amongst the worst, if not the worst, um, major company in this country when it comes to treatment of LGBT people. Um, Mobil actually was a good company, a good corporate citizen, until Exxon uh, merged with them and took them over, and they rolled back all their protections, all their benefits, and has truly been amongst the worst players uh, in the country. By President Obama issuing the executive order, uh, it immediately covers companies like Exxon because they are amongst the largest federal contractors uh, in this country. Um, oh, President Obama, we, we have to acknowledge, has done more uh, for the LGBT movement than any president in the history of this country. Um, and as activists, it's been all of our jobs uh, to push him. I never once had a moment um, in my life, um, in addition to pr prior to taking this job, where every single time I was in front of the president or the vice president, um, that I didn't use that as a moment uh, to push them on the issue uh, of marriage. And it's our job to push. We have to be comfortable pushing our friends. They should be the folks that it's easiest for us to. Our friends respect us when we push them. Um, that's why they're our friends. We're, we have those relationships so that uh, we can ask for more. Um, so the executive order, um, right now, um, HRC, along with other organizations uh, in the movement, um, have invested in a coalition uh, that's headquartered uh, in the first floor of our building to pass INDA um, and to pass a fully inclusive INDA. We just came out of committee with three Republican votes, including Orrin Hatch, um, and uh, Senator Reid has promised a floor vote. Um, and I believe we'll get to 60 uh, with a massive effort. Then it will go to the House, and we will see what happens. We will continue to push, and I am ever the optimist on these things. And I do believe everyone evolves. Uh, the House of lately has not been willing to do anything. Um, so if we uh, fall into that category, I hope that'll be the moment uh, that President Obama uses uh, to sign the executive order. Um, but it will not be the end goal. The end goal is to get a fully inclusive ENDA out of the Senate, the House, and the signature of the President. Uh, and that, by the way, only covers uh, employment non-discrimination, not housing or education or a number of other things that states have moved forward on. Um, as it relates to, uh, to A for HRC, um, I can only say that I've always been uh, the same person. I think some of the things that you said uh, perhaps were perception issues as opposed uh, to reality. Um, HRC is an organization that I've had great respect for my entire life, including when I was um, a closeted uh, kid in Arkansas. Um, it is an organization that has over 1.5 million uh, members in this country. We can always do better. We can always be better partners. Um, I come at this as a political strategist with a goal to win. And when it comes to the lives of LGBT youth, it is whatever it takes to win the fastest. Um, and I'm very proud in the year and a half or less that I've been there uh, that we have made smart strategic decisions as it relates to investing in the states. Uh, with our state partners, having our first victories uh, at the ballot box, uh, saving our first justice attempt to recall uh, Justice Wiggins in Iowa. Um, and so I'm very proud of all that we've accomplished uh, in this year and a half, but it's not enough, and we have a lot more to do. Okay, my last question is to Joe, and then I'll let Michael uh, come to the podium and take uh, the floor. Uh, Joe, um, Obama is the most pro-gay president in history. And as a political scientist, I can attest to that. Obama is way more pro-gay than William Henry Harrison, and he is just 
head and shoulders above Grover Cleveland. And um, so th that's an accomplishment, but um, I think that there is an alternative interpretation. And since you are one of the original friends of Barack, I'd like to hear your view on the administration. Specifically, even though the administration did in fact sign the repeal of DOMA into law and the president supported marriage equality before the 2012 election and dropped the DOMA defense, they've been very slow on marriage and again, no employment non-discrimination executive order. Is the Obama administration an ally, an enemy, scared, or irrelevant? Uh, I think scared would define the original years of the administration, but I think that scared attitude, that scared view was the predominant view. They were scared of the gay issue in general. I mean, you gotta remember, the chief of staff was Rahm Emanuel, okay? And Rahm, people on the Hill knew, he, was, he, he invented political homophobia practically. He was very happy as chair of the DCCC to take our money and ask for it. But when people went up and asked for votes, he was always the one that would say, you're gonna kill us, you're gonna kill us, you're gonna kill us. He said this to lobbyists, people at HRC and others had heard it around town. So Rahm was also around in 1993 when Bill Clinton got burned on Don't Ask, Don't Tell and was not going to let that happen again. So, um, and his deputy chief of staff was, you know, the henchman. Jim Messina was the henchman to enact that. And, 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 and so I think what happened is, you know, Chad thinks that our friends appreciate us pushing them. That was not my experience. I pushed, we pushed them and push them and push them. I got a lot of pushback. And I got pushback from people around town who would say to me, what is wrong with you? And I'd say, I'm just asking him to do what he promised. And, and in Washington, like, that means you're an idiot. Like, you believed a politician? What is wrong with you, Joe Sudbury? <laughs> but I, and, and I think that surprised them. I mean, one of the things the president always said is, if you want me to do things, push me. So we did. We, and the LGBT community, was the only, really, uh, was really one of the only progressive groups that did. The immigration groups followed us. Um, the Dreamers, actually, many of them are LGBT, and they took up the charge too. And if you look at you know, what happened in 2012, Obama came up for marriage, and then about five weeks later, he signed and he, he, um, he uh, issued an order that protected the Dreamers from deportation. So I, I often get the question, and this is a typical DC thing where people are like, Joe, how did you guys make such progress? And I said, well, okay, you just have to remember, the first thing you have to do is push your friends and sometimes you have to fight the administration. And then as soon as I say that, I feel like people look at me and go, okay, don't tell anyone I was talking to you, okay? I'm just gonna back away, like, I didn't hear that. So there is, you know, as much as we say we have to push our friends, there is an aversion to do that in the District of Columbia from the progressive advocacy community. They don't do it. They, they, they worry about access. They worry about access for the sake of access, not access for the sake of progress. Um, and that's my, I've been in Washington for 20 years. I've watched that for years happen. I think, you know, I think, People learned a lot from what we did, and, and you do, look at, and I'm not saying access doesn't matter. You need an inside game, you need an outside game. It's really good if the inside and the outside are talking and coordinating, but to make Barack Obama, for Barack Obama to be where he was, he, he, he didn't do it without a lot of pushing from, from people sitting at this table and, you know, and creating opportunities for him to come where he is. Now, on a personal level, do I think, you know what, he's younger than me, like a year or two younger than me. I think Barack Obama probably, if he thinks about LGBT equality, believes in it fully. I think his wife really does. And I think that, um, you know, when, I, I, I think what he did though was an important thing when he talked about evolving. A lot of people thought, well, that's just a political ploy. But I think he did what a lot of people were doing. I've seen it in my family. I've seen it in Carlos's family, my partner's family, people really have evolved a lot on the issue. And I think the president gave people a process to go through that he went through. And I think that's one of the reasons we had some of the success we had in 
November of 2012 when we won those elections because in a lot of those states, I think there were a lot of people who felt a lot better about voting with us because Obama did, so. True. So I just have um, two quick questions kind of for the panel at large and then we can open it up to the audience. But my first one kind of plays off, off that response, Joe. We've talked about moving with the movement and we've talked about pushing our friends and taking calculated risks uh, in courts and bringing cases. You know, I'm, I'm from the Twin Cities area in Minnesota and one of the things that has struck me uh, through this is just how quickly things have evolved. I mean, in November, we narrowly fought off a constitutional amendment in our state constitution that would have um, defined marriage as between a man and a woman. And then in August, we had our first legal gay marriages in Minnesota. So the question kind of for all of you is, how do you play the inside and the outside game when things are moving so rapidly and when the movement itself is at so many different places? Look, I, I think, um, first of all, if you, if you study any, whether it's women's rights movement, the, the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, there is no question the inside and outside game is necessary to win. There's, there's no question. In fact, oftentimes one uh, helps the other, particularly if coordinated. Um, a great example, and um, when Robin was talking about right after Prop 8 passed, one of the first things um, we did is I went and sat down with Robin and with Kip uh, in San Francisco and said, look, we are filing this case. We're going to shine the spotlight on two couples and two bipartisan lawyers. Um, you have a completely different strategy, but let's coordinate and let's be on the same message. And oftentimes we won't even acknowledge that we are doing so. And we had a seamless relationship um, as it related to supporting and promoting uh, that Prop 8 case. And I guess in, in that case, in many ways, I was kind of the insider uh, and Robin would have been uh, the outsider. Um, but it does, it does take both. And oftentimes, uh, if you look at, for instance, all that's happening, as you, as you mentioned, in the states, those really are, everyone has been a coordinated player, regardless of where they had been in the movement before. If you look at our success in any of those states where we've won marriage at the ballot box, and your home state of Minnesota is a brilliant one, where we not only defeated an evil constitutional ban uh, at the ballot box, we turned around three months later and got marriage in the state legislature. And those were groups coming together, working off of a single strategic plan, off of a single budget with one campaign manager and everyone in the same room. Now, perhaps it, we didn't always agree on a particular strategy or it's what, not, what one organization might or might not have done in the past, but for the sake, excuse me, for the sake of winning, everyone was on the same page and we won. And I think that is a lesson really across the board on how we can win these. We had the same type of coordinated campaign um, around the Supreme Court uh, oral arguments leading up to uh, day of and, and after. And we have a, a similar effort um, as it relates to the passage uh, of INDA. And I think that we need to view sort of everyone on our side, if you will, as partners and potential partners and focus the vast majority of our energy, effort, and fire towards those on the other side who spend their living days trying to figure out how they can defeat us uh, or stop us. And for the most part, um, that's what we have in this movement today. I would, I would agree with um, much of what Chad said, but I just want to sort of throw out a bit about sort of what went on with Minnesota, um, as well as Maryland and, and Maine and Washington State, because we still saw, even in those efforts, um, and, and we can go back to North Carolina as well, you know, we still saw this sort of inside and outside kind of not working together. There were groups that said, oh, we can't win in those states. We're not going to put the money there. Um, there were uh, people who kind of wrote them off. Um, and, you know, what we saw in the end, and nobody thought that we were going to win all of those states. Six months before, nobody thought, and, and, and Minnesota was the primary example. Everybody thought that was a goner. Uh, public opinion is shifting. We're doing a great job getting the message out. Things are changing. But more than that, you, you sort of have to be in it no matter what. And North Carolina was a perfect example. 
we should never, we should never not give up. A, we should never not give a fight. We must be in the fight, uh, no matter what. And when we sort of, you know, hand it over to them, you know, we're losing. And you know, just as with we see what happens with elections. If you're not in it, if you're not doing it, you can't take advantage of a sudden swing, uh, you know, in public opinion. Uh, I think that did happen uh, in the end with those states, but early on, we weren't seeing that. We were seeing a lot of fight. A lot of people were arguing about what was, you know, what resources were going to those particular states. And North Carolina was a perfect example. Yeah. I, I just, just want one take off of what Michael said. He was specifically referring there to the state uh, of Maryland. Uh, Maryland was a state um, that we had been in quite heavily, but most people thought there was no chance uh, of winning. And what they would say is, first of all, we have to acknowledge, there. I would love for us to have limitless money in this movement. I would love it. Um, but we have so many donors in this movement that are willing to fund so many campaigns at the same time. Um, and, and we made uh, Maryland one of the priorities. But if you were to talk to folks going into it, and much of the infighting was, you can't win because it's heavily Catholic. You can't win because of the, the prevalence of uh, of the churches in that state, particularly African American churches, African Americans who've historically been uh, not been with us on some of these ballot votes. Um, Forty percent of the electorate there was African American. Um, we in that campaign believed that we had a plan, we had a way to win it. Um, ultimately, um, towards the end, everyone did come along and join uh, on that campaign. But the differences weren't insider versus outsider. It was a bit more of with limited resources, we don't want to go to Maryland. We're going to write that off. Um, and luckily, there were enough folks who were willing to not write off Maryland um, that we had a strategy, and, and we won Maryland in addition to the other state that folks didn't think there was a chance in, and that was, uh, that was Minnesota. Can I say one thing here? I, I think, um, take, aside from the marriage issue, I look back um, in the first two years of 2009, 2010, the Democrats had a huge majority in the Senate, mm -hmm. filibuster proof here and there. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, big margin in the House. And the plan was, and I heard this from everybody, Mark Obama told me, everyone else, HRC had this plan, we would pass hate crimes, we would pass ENDA, we would pass hate crimes in the first year, um, first year, ENDA in the second year, Don't Ask, Don't Tell would be in 2011, and then in the second term, DOMA repeal. Some variation of that, but it was always gonna be in that order. So hate crimes get done, finally, it had already passed in the previous Congress when there were much less of majorities. And, and then, so then it was, what are we going to do? Don't ask, don't tell, and end up. Don't ask, don't tell, there was a really effective inside outside game. Mm. There were organizations, Service Members Legal Defense Network. I will give Aubrey Sarvis, he was an yeah. you know, older gentleman who'd been around DC for a long time. He was willing to risk and play the outside game. He understood. And especially as we got further into 2010, that if we didn't get it done in 2010, we weren't getting it done. And Aubrey couldn't do that. On ENDA, I, Carrie Elleveld was the advocate um, reporter in DC and did an amazing job. We would not have nearly the success we had if we didn't have a reporter like her sitting in the briefing room. We were talking about it afterwards. I never got any intel. Like no one ever called me up or scooped me anything about ENDA. There was a tight, held inside game on Employment Non-Discrimination Act. And, you know, I mean, it is kind of stunning when you think ENDA still isn't done, Don't Ask, Don't Tell has been repealed, DOMA is gone. But I, I think that was, to me, that's a classic story of when you play an inside-outside game and you have players who are willing to coordinate and collaborate, and then you have another issue where it's just a very tightly held inside game and no one's sharing any information and we're just going to get it all done ourselves. It didn't happen. I just want to say really quick two uh, different things. Uh, Get Equal is a part of the coalition team that's working uh, around the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, but um, you, although you're saying let's all work together, I'm not saying this to Chad, what I was saying in reference to the question, it is hard to all get on the same page. You know, at, at one point during the Don't Ask, Don't Tell years, there were people asking for a stop loss from the president, and some groups were saying, no, you can't ask for that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now you see, and you know, what we had during the Don't Ask, Don't Tell years, I would uh, say exactly what Joe said. We had people emailing us from Air Force One, reporters giving us intel. We had people from HRC telling us what details they were giving about where the president was going to be. So wherever he showed up, there was banners there that said, you know, don't ask, don't give. Um, and 
all of those things in the collaborated effort is what created that continual pressure. And I believe specifically with this president, he speaks to pressure a lot of times. You know, the squeaky wheel is what gets the grease. But for the second thing I would say, especially if we look at India, the religious ex exemptions for me and for Get Equal, um, you know, put Chick-fil-A and any other religious-based um, affiliated, you know, employer at the advantage. And I think, you know, sadly we get to positions where when we talk about legislation, it's either, either you're with us or you're against us instead of saying, okay, how can we pressure to bring attention? You know, when we get equal uh, question Michelle Obama at a fundraiser in Washington, D.C., and you would have thought from our uh, local organizations and our own people that we were the pariah, but for the first time we had international press around Indian. People were talking about the fact that across the United States, most of the people thought we already had employment protections. So do we need to get our hands dirty and look like we're not nice all the time? Absolutely, and get equal sign up every single day to do that. But that gives Chad and the other people that are the insiders the ability to say, look, we can't make this issue go away. And you've got to have that collaboration. But it also has to be around areas where you're saying, a thing like the religious exemption, in my opinion, is harmful to us. If we pass, in my opinion, this ENDA, and the ACLU is already saying it's going to set us up. Um, and we're going to be in situations, I don't think we should fight for things just because we need, it's the next thing on the ticker, the way that uh, Mike said, I think we should fight for things because they're right, and it's the right bill at the right time, and we can get the full support, and if the grassroots is calling for it, and the organizations think they can get it, that's how you make it happen. You know, I do have another question about social media, but I think at this point, it might be a good opportunity to open it up to the audience, if anyone else has questions. We do have um, microphones in the aisles if you just want to step up and ask. Hello, all of you, thank you. Well, maybe they're not on, no. but we have them. There you go. <laughs> Hello. Okay, perfect. So my question is just to the general panel. Um, all of you have such amazing stories, and you all have done so much in the field of uh, you know, fighting for marriage equality and fighting for our rights. So my question is, what keeps you all going? Like, what keeps you motivated? Why do you continue to do this? Like, you've already given so much of yourself to the work. What, like, what is it about, I mean, obviously I know what it is, but what is it for you personally that keeps you motivated? I want to die equal. I, I think every single day about the young person that I once was growing up uh, in Arkansas. Whereas when most people would go to bed at night, they'd turn out the lights and they'd go to sleep, I'd stare at the ceiling every night, staying awake, and I know this is the experience of many, many people um, probably in this room, but I would lie awake um, at night fearing what could face me uh, the next day at school or at church or wherever, uh, wherever I was going. Um, for an average LGBT young person today, life's not so different. Um, and there are still tragic consequences every single day that happen specifically because our government, local, state, and federal, tells them that they're second-class citizens and gives license to others to discriminate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is life or death. And if we make all of our decisions through the lens of what's in the best interest of that young person, um, then we'll be doing right by them, and I think we can all be proud of the work we're doing. Um, I, I have to say I agree with all that, and I, and I um, you know, um, definitely want to do whatever I can to help people, but I have to tell all of you, I'm also very, you know, uh, I have very selfish reasons as well. I absolutely love doing this work. It is the most fun, the most exciting, the most passionate. Um, to be able to lead a conversation on the radio, to be able to talk to people, um, write things that inspire people, hear back from people, uh, get the input from people. Um, it, it's a privilege and it's amazing. And I, and I just want to say to anybody who you know, is thinking about it, it, it's also enormous fun, challenging right-wing nutbags, you know, <laughs> uh, taking them on, speaking out, get, exposing their lies and hypocrisy, watching them slither away. It's great fun, I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah, I just feel, I, I, I agree with everything everyone says. I want to die equal, I worry about the kids, and it is fun. And I just feel really blessed. I mean, like, this is what I get to do. Like, it just, it's amazing to me, and I do love doing it. And, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's just every day. Thanks for the question. Great question. 
I don't know where that is. This on? Oh, good. Um, thank you. It's really all very interesting to hear what everybody says has to say. And I think my question is a little bit the flip side are related to yours. My name is Suzanne Goldberg. I was at Lambda for about 10 years, and I'm a law professor now. And the, qu the question is this, because you talked a lot about, um, I think one of the questions when you've been doing this for a long time is, well, what have you learned? And you've all talked a lot about that. And I, th and I think it's also always interesting to me to figure out, well, what lessons have we learned from it? And so I'm going to ask you the, the, that question, but in this way. So have you made any mistakes along the way? And, what, and what's one that really sort of is salient for you and in the vein of what would you do differently? And I guess while, while, uh, while you're pondering that, I'll just say that in the mid-90s, I was in, I spent a fair amount of time in Arkansas, in Little Rock, putting wow. together a sodomy law challenge and oh. remember having fried green tomatoes and sitting over meals, <laughs> talking to people about, about stepping up and, and bringing that together. So I, ju I also want to suggest that although the conversation wasn't about marriage, those conversations toward equality have actually been happening for a while, really in lots of places in the country. Thank you for your uh, work. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, God, I make mistakes every day, so many that I, I, I can't count. Uh, when I say lessons, I think about lessons learned, it's right off no one when it comes to this issue. Right off no one. Even in the most conservative of corners, there is someone that has um, a LGBT brother, sister, mother, father, colleague, and almost every trip I go on, um, I meet someone who no one would ever think could be an ally. Now, some of them are closeted, not closeted as in LGBT, they're closeted allies. They will meet with you privately, um, particularly as you travel in some of these southern states, but they aren't yet ready and don't know how uh, to step forward. Um, Ted Olson, I, you know, I think back, what made me say yes to talk to Ted Olson? I, I, I mean, it, it's just not something that you would typically think, oh, well, I'll talk to Ted Olson. The natural inclination would have been, there's not a chance in hell, why would I waste my time with that? You wouldn't follow it up. Um, and on this issue, on this issue specifically, um, the polling shows that eight out of 10 plus uh, Americans say that they know someone that is LGBT, close to them, close in their family circle, colleagues at work. Um, and I think you know, the real lesson for me personally and professionally uh, is have the conversation. Have the conversation uh, in places of worship, in the most conservative um, uh, of state legislatures. Um, there are allies. They may not yet be vocal, um, but they are the next ones. They're the next ones that we need to step forward uh, in order to do this. So write off no one, I think, is the, the most important life lesson uh, for me on this. And be willing to engage uh, with those that you would think uh, would be with you. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I think, um, I, I think of the lesson, the, the, the biggest lesson I've learned over the past 20 years in Washington is, um, it really is be true to yourself, and I know that sounds kind of corny, but it's it's a it, and I and I'm I'm giving kind of a Washington centric answer because I think it, it it's important to understand a lot of how things happen there, um, and I think it can it can be very easy to get caught up in the in this town as they call it, and lose sight of what's important. And, and that was one of the things writing on the blog let me do, was kind of um, have a voice that was my own and a space that was my own and in a protected space because it, it, it was really interesting how once people started figuring out that people were reading the blogs and stuff, then it kind of gave me a little like, a, I, I, it was my kryptonite kind of, you know. I had, I had freedom to be who I was. And it was, much, it was very freeing and, I, and, and not just being out and gay and everything like that, but being free to stand on my principles, because it's a really hard town to stay true to what you believe in. And, and I think sometimes, you know, when you get off that path and you get caught up in, 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 the, in the power or the access or anything like that, that's when you lose sight of what you believe in. And, and, and if I ever stepped off, that would be the mistake. And coming back and sticking with it is, has always been important, mm -hmm. has, has what sustained me. Um, in terms of lessons, learned 
and having been through so many different sort of, you know, ups and downs and ups and downs, and we had a lot more downs just a few years ago and then ups and downs. Um, and then obviously going back to the 80s and uh, AIDS, I, I think that we sometimes, the lesson I've learned is that we get really, really enthralled and really, really depressed <laughs> too many times. Um, and, and we think it's all done and it's over and it's finished and we've won and we're, people are saying that now. You see it all over. Time Magazine had it on the cover, right? Uh, it's over, you know, the, the, it's, the marriage is won. Even before the Supreme Court even ruled, they said, I think their headline was, um, it, you know, America, the Supreme Court hasn't decided, but America has. When America hasn't decided anything, 51% of the population, maybe, according to polls, supports uh, gay marriage. And then, as Chad said, if you were to look at that regionally, well, it's probably, and it's just a certain part of the country, um, so we get overly enthralled, and, and, and I've learned that lesson. We also get overly, you know, completely dejected and depressed when we have those losses. And, and you know, a few years ago, particularly in the states at the Supreme Courts, we were getting, we were having a lot, and people were just, and I mean, I can remember when George Bush won re-election, and people were crying on the, on the, calling the show. I mean, we, so... I think we, uh, the lesson I've learned is we have to see this as a much, much bigger, longer, um, you know, uh, fight that's not nearly over, but, you know, we've obviously um, come very far. In terms of mistakes made, I, you know, I think I need to bite my tongue a lot of times because <laughs> I've probably had too many arguments with too many people I really... Uh, like and um, well, others I don't, but you know. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I probably need to pull back sometimes. That's that's a less that's that's a lesson I've learned about mistakes. Uh, first, it's all the time that I missed with my kids for the two years that I was tra I mean, I wasn't at home after Prop Eight. I just went on the road. Uh, promoting California, you know, meet in the middle and then National Quality March and then living almost uh, half the year in D.C. during the Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, time uh, and missing that time. And, and, you know, I would say, you know, what Mike said about holding my tongue, you know, I got labeled as the bitch, excuse my language, but um, I think a lot of times uh, there's, there are women in this movement, but women in this movement get labeled as the bitch if they speak out, but uh, the men in the movement are being powerful and gruff and strong and showing leadership sometimes. Um, and I feel like there was a lot of times that um, that anger came from being hurt. It didn't come from, you know, hating anyone or feeling like uh, anybody was intentionally trying to, you know, not represent the South or, um, you know, only listen to the elite donors, et cetera. It really came from a sense of emotional hurt. Um, and I think that what I regret is not articulating that clearly enough, but I was in such pain of, you know, missing my kids and try, you know, it's kind of like being sucker punched. You don't know really what's going on. Um, and I think that what I regret in that 2010 year is not pushing for end as hard as we were pushing for DADT. Um, but we saw a window closing and we just chose what was getting the traction. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, that we, could potentially have at least gotten somewhere with a vote in either the House or uh, the Senate, and I think that would have pushed us even further along in our end of discussion. Um, and the final thing is not writing anything down, because now um, there's conversations I wish I could remember more and moments in, in, the mo in that movement that I wish I could remember more, but it was just, there was no time. Thank you, Michael. Um, oh, last question, and then we're going to go home. Hi, thanks so much for coming. It's really inspiring to see all of you here at Stanford. Um, I have a question about inclusivity. Uh, this panel is very white, um, and I think that there have been a lot of 
really important and valid critiques of the mainstream LGBT movement and LGBT organizations for sometimes coming across as not very inclusive to queer communities of color, low-income communities, transgender communities. I know the HRC in the past has had a really fraught relationship with transgender communities. So I was wondering what you do as activists to try and create anti-racist organizations and ones that are inclusive of all the very different types of queer people there are in the United States and ones that listen to all of their needs and amplify their voices. Sure. Well, I can't speak to the decision as to who is on this Pam's panel. Ball, Pam Spalding was invited to participate <laughs> for health reasons. She backed off. Couldn't be here. Um, look, it's something um, that we can always do better. Um, as it relates uh, to the transgender community, I believe, and it's why, that we have made this uh, a priority of getting INDA done and getting INDA as far as we can get it. It is not perfect um, as it relates to the religious exemption um, that Robin was talking about. but. The transgender community is the most discriminated against community in this country. We can always do better and we can always do more. Um, we need into passed, we need it signed. We also need the president to issue uh, the executive order uh, to provide those protections and provide them now uh, because they're needed now. Um, also, as it relates to inclusivity, I really think in the past two years, organizations across the board have done a much better job um, about talking to our community. And we are all colors, we are all stripes, and we are all types. Um, and that's why I think it, it's one of the parts of the formula that allowed us to win these victories that we won this time. Uh, because we were fighting in some of the most diverse of states. I gave the uh, example uh, of Maryland. Um, we had incredible partnerships uh, in that state. My very first meeting, before I'd even met with my staff on this, uh, when I walked into the building, the first meeting I had was with Ben Jealous, who um, is the current president of the NAACP and is just stepping down, uh, sadly, at the end of the year. Uh, but we committed that day uh, to form a tight personal and professional partnership uh, where we could achieve victories by working together, coordinating, uh, and collaborating. And I give Ben and the NAACP and that partnership a tremendous credit for the success. I don't think we could have won Maryland uh, without it. Um, also, as we move uh, into the South in particular and really look at campaigns and organizing in the South more aggressively than we've ever done before, those are some of the most diverse communities uh, in this country. Um, so we've got to always do better and we can always do better, but I do think uh, in the last couple of years our movement has made incredible progress. A last word from anyone else on inclusivity? I, I, to, to that point, what, what Chad was just saying about in the last few years, we've, we've made um, strides on inclusivity. I would say also it's because more people have come forward yeah. um, to speak out and to be spokespeople for all the various um, you know, groups that come under the umbrella of LGBT and um, certainly among LGBT people of color. And for me, uh, in, in what I do as a radio host, also an editor at Huffington Post, that has been uh, just enormous because we've been able to have people speak for themselves rather than talk about people's lives, actually have people come on and engage, have people uh, write about their own lives. And it, it, it's, it's enormous for so many reasons. Um, not just in, in sense, not just for, you know, obviously including people uh, because they should be represented, but we can't make the argument to this diverse country unless we have that mm -hmm. diversity making the argument because people listen to people of their own communities and uh, we need to be able to really have that, um, that interaction and, and make the argument that way. So I've been really encouraged by how many people have now been really uh, coming forward and speaking out and um, you know we have a lot more outlets where we could do it and that's great too. Yeah, that, that helps, that helps having the outlets. Like that, that um, I just think back to when I started blogging in 2004 and it was just such a different place and, and um, it's provided platforms for people and it's been great. And, and I mentioned that you work on immigration and the most, you know, the, the dreamer movement that I mentioned earlier, those kids who got the president, you cannot believe how many of them are queer. They're so ballsy, they're so awesome, and, and they inspire me every single day. Um, 
Actually, one of them runs Get Equal now, too. Uh, Felipe left the immigration movement to work on the uh, LGBT movement. But yeah, I think, I think Mike made a really good point, too. So. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists for their comments tonight. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.